So uh, welcome everyone to the AAA seminar series. Um, as usual now, uh, we're on Zoom and uh, it would be great if you could all stay muted for the course of the seminar. And if you think of any questions that you'd like to ask, you can let me know via the chat and then I'd call on you at the end of the seminar to ask them um, or, um, or else also call for people um, when we get to the end. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Eleanor Slade to speak. Um, Dr. Slade is an ecologist whose research focuses on the challenges and opportunities associated with conservation management and restoration of tropical forest landscapes. And she's worked in quite a variety of areas in the rainforests of, and oil palm plantations in Malaysia, Sumatra, the Philippines, Belize and Brazil, and in the woodlands and agricultural systems of Finland and the UK. Her research is focused on the links between biodiversity and ecosystem function, with a particular emphasis on invertebrate biodiversity and community interactions. Much of her research has been focused on dung beetles as a model system, but she's also worked on a range of other taxa, including moths, and wood lice, wood lice and um, hornbills, and even small mammals. She's also interested in the development of policy and the best practice in the oil palm industry, and is working with government agencies and NGOs engaged in land use planning in Malaysia. So today, Eleanor will talk to us about using trait-based ecology to study responses of insects and their associated functions along environmental gradients. Welcome, Eleanor. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Helena, for inviting me here. Um, and yeah, um, thanks for, for coming to listen this morning. It's really a pleasure to be here virtually um, today. I hope one day I can um, come and visit you all in, um, in person in Melbourne. So what I wanted to do was start with a very quick overview of um, trait-based ecology in general and where it is in terms of invertebrates. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the work um, that we've been doing looking at dung beetles as model systems to study traits and community responses to habitat and climate change. And when I say we, I mean we in the broadest sense of that a lot of the work that of course I'm gonna be presenting is work that's been done by my amazing um, PhD students um, and postdocs in the group. So what are traits? Um, I think we're fairly familiar with um, the use of trait to describe, for example, um, personality. So we can think of personality traits as perhaps behavioral traits or what people sometimes call um, soft traits. Um, but we've also got traits that we can um, measure. So for example, morphological traits, and these are sometimes called harder traits because you can actually measure them. So things like um, the shape of your nose or the color of your hair or the color of your eyes. So Violetal gave us this um, nice definition of the trait as morphological, biochemical, physiological, structural, phenological, or behavioral characteristics that are expressed in phenotypes of individual organisms. And so a single genotype can have several phenotypes and so multiple different variations in the way that a trait is expressed. And this is what we can then measure. So that sounds relatively simple, um, but for those of you that work um, on traits, you'll know that there's a lot of confusion around um, trait um, definitions and discussion around um, how we actually define traits. So if we think of something like leaf toughness, um, which is a trait um, that's often measured in plant studies. Um, you can think about this as a trait in itself, but when we think about what makes up leaf toughness, um, this actually depends on various anatomical or morphological characteristics, such as the venation um, architecture on the leaf, chemical characteristics such as lignin concentration. And so these individual um, characteristics themselves, such as lignin, can, can be considered, they can be measured and they could um, be used as um, traits as well. Um, so to a certain extent, what you call a trait can be somewhat um, subjective. And I actually think this is a very important thing and something I've been discussing a lot with um, the people that I work with on traits that when you're choosing traits to measure, um, we really should be thinking about what is the question you're trying to ask uh, with those traits. So don't just measure a trait because this is the easiest trait to measure or because this is the trait that everybody else has measured when they've been looking at these particular organisms, but think about what is that um, trait um, 
trying um, to show us if we're asking, for example, about how that relates to ecosystem functioning, does that trace actually link through to the function that you're trying to measure or the response of the, um, to the environment um, of the um, organism that you're trying to measure? So of course, traits have been used for hundreds um, of years. If we think about taxonomy, that's basically using morphological traits to classify um, organisms. Um, but what Sandra Diaz et al did in the um, seminal paper in um, 2013 is that they actually started to look at um, traits um, as functional traits. So those traits that are relevant to the response of organisms to the environment, um, and all their effects on ecosystem um, properties. And what Sandra um, did was that she um, classified traits into two different types of traits. So I hope you can um, see my pointer. So over here, we've got um, the species and they've been classified um, taxonomically here by a set of um, traits, their morphological traits. And then what Sandra suggested was that we could have um, we could split these traits up into two different types of traits. So we can have the effect traits, and these are traits that vary in their effects on ecosystem properties. So down here, we've got the effect traits, um, and these are traits that feed through into ecosystem processes, ecosystem functions, or ecosystem services. And so if we think about dung beetles, as that's the, the group that I work on, an effect trait could be something um, like the body size of the beetle or the hind legs um, length um, or, or front leg morphology of the beetle that help it in digging um, and affect the ecosystem properties of dung removal or seed dispersal. So how big the legs are, how big the beetle is, is going to have a direct impact on the, the um, process of dung removal. The other type of traits that she classified were um, response traits, and these are traits that vary in the response um, to environmental conditions. So um, again, if we think about dung beetles, um, these environmental conditions, so for example, if we've got climate change or we've got land use change, um, the beetle might be responding to something like increases in um, temperature. Um, and so we then might measure something, think about a trait that might respond to that in the beetle. And so these might be traits more like physiological traits. So um, things, for example, like the CT max of the beetle, the ability of the beetle, what's the temperature, the maximum temperature that that beetle can survive at. So those might be the sorts of traits that we might measure as um, response traits. And these are traits then um, that are being filtered um, that are, are filtering the extinction rates or the persistence of that animal through these environmental drivers such as climate change or habitat change. And so these traits then determine whether those animals persist or increase or decrease in abundance. And of course, this then has a feedback loop because um, those species that um, persist will feed back into this pool with that specific sorts of traits. And those traits will have a specific sort um, of, um, of effect traits. And so those will affect the ecosystem processes and services. So this is, is in, a, in a sense, a complete circle. And what's important to remember here is that effect traits and response traits are not mutually um, exclusive. So you can have traits that you measure that can either be a response trait um, or an effect trait. So if we take, for example, body sizing dung beetles, this can be an effect trait because it, the size of the beetle affects how much dung it buries, but it can also be a response trait because the size of the beetle also affects its ability to move and disperse across the landscape in response to climate change. It might also affect its ability to with, um, withstand um, extremes in temperature. Um, so I know that some people have been um, a little bit critical of this and don't like this um, classification, but personally, I find this um, quite useful um, way of thinking um, about um, a framework to think about um, traits and linking it through to the questions we might want to um, ask. So we've been um, trying to do this um, with dung beetles. Um, so a group of us now about 15 years ago actually started to try and put together a trait database for dung beetles and think about how the traits that we were measuring in dung beetles linked to the functions or linked to the responses to the environment. And despite all this talk about how important 
important it is to document insects and look at their traits. Turns out it's super hard to get funding for this. So we've tried several times now from various um, places and nobody has yet funded this, but um, we're all continuing to work on it. Um, and so Indra de Castro and his supervisor, Joaquin Hortal, um, so Indra has been working on this um, for his PhD and he's come up with this very nice table which I think shows this very well. So here he's listed the traits um, and groups these different um, traits into morphological traits, physiological traits. Um, and then he's linked these to various ecosystem functions. So what we thought about is which functions um, do dung beetles contribute to? And then we went through and looked at which traits might contribute to which ones of th which of these functions. And then you can come up with a trait um, functioning matrix. And similarly, you can do this to look at which traits might be response traits. So you can think of all the filters and forces that might impact um, dung beetles. And then you can think about whether that trait might help to explain the response of the beetle to that particular filter and come up with a, a matrix of environment um, versus um, trait relations. So I think this is a super um, a good, super good way to look at, to link functions with traits um, and with um, traits with um, species responses to environments and really think about what you're measuring and what that can tell you. And this is super important because it turns out it's the traits rather than the abundance of species um, or the richness of species um, that better predict ecosystem functioning. So when people started, uh, first started looking at biodiversity ecosystem function relationships, they were measuring um, usually species richness or species diversity and looking at how um, functioning responded to that. And often they found um, that this was, that this relationship was not very clear. Um, and so I was involved in this um, interesting paper, which then took a whole bunch of studies um, and looked at comparing species um, richness indices, species diversity indices with functional richness and diversity indices. And so on the y-axis you have um, the relative ranks and, the, and basically the lower the rank, the greater the explanatory um, power. Um, and then here you've got the typical species richness um, index that you might use. And then you've got a bunch of functional um, indices. So the same way that you can measure species richness, you can measure a bunch of traits and come up with the functional richness indices or a functional um, diversity indices. Um, and this is the community weighted um, mean of traits. And you can see that these are explaining um, ecosystem functioning much better than the um, than the species richness indices. And so the importance of species um, identity and the traits of individual species becomes even more important if we're going to consider ecosystem multifunctionality. Um, so I worked with um, Robert Batchy and Chris Philipson um, to look at this a little bit. Um, and so what we've plotted um, here at the bottom is species richness with two different ecosystem functions. So ecosystem multifunctionality is when you're looking at multiple functions within an ecosystem. And if we're gonna look at real world ecosystems, then um, each species or each taxa is contributing to lots of different functions. And so we might want to consider those all together. So not just consider dung removal in dung beetles, but consider dung removal, but also its effect on um, dung beetles effects on greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So here with these two um, ecosystem um, functions, we've got the same set of species contributing to each um, ecosystem um, function um, all the way through. However, if we look at this relationship here, um, although we've got three species contributing to this ecosystem function and three species contributing to this ecosystem function, what you've actually got um, are um, different species then contributing um, to the ecosystem function. So you've got two species that are shared, but one species each that is um, different. So when each function is dependent um, on different sets of species, more species are necessary to maximize the total functionality compared with if you just look at each function um, separately. And this is because different um, traits, uh, different species are involved with, with different traits. So species identity, um, i.e. The, the traits of the species and also the context um, that you're considering them in 
So for example, which functions you're actually considering um, is really important if we're going to understand these biodiversity um, ecosystem functioning relationships. So um, looking a bit at traits, so traits, um, traits as a, as a theme, um, to a theme of research um, is relatively new actually. So trait-based ecology began in the late um, 1990s. And similarly to biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationships, it's traditionally um, been studied in plant communities. So where we have um, the best data on traits um, globally are through um, databases. So for example, TRI, which is the plant um, traits database. Um, there were um, things set up like um, TraitNet. So TraitNet was supposed to be set up to create a universal trait database and to provide standardization and curation of trait data. And this was actually set up to try and document traits um, across all plant and animal taxa. So you can see here that they include animals as well. But when you actually look at the list of databases that are available, what you actually find is, is that most of them are still um, for plants. So actually creating a global trait database is, is incredibly um, hard to do. But what um, databases like um, TRI have done, they've been super successful. So in just two decades of research, they've really helped to improve the understanding um, of how communities are assembled, how plant communities are structured and how they function. Um, and so what it's enabled us to, um, to do is to look at global um, trait environmental relationships of plant communities. Um, and so what, what having a database like this um, allows you to do is to look um, at the, the species level um, or the, the community level. And what you find is that, that at this level, trait combinations um, are depending on trade-offs representing different ecological strategies. So you can see here, you've got things like leaf nitrogen, um, um, carbon, seed mass, seed length, and that's um, splitting up these um, communities um, by these different traits. But at the community level, um, trait combinations are expected to be decoupled from these trade-offs because different strategies are then enabling um, facilitation of coexistence within communities. And then this allows us then to look at um, what happens when you combine um, these traits and you look at responses over um, large global um, or large um, spatial scales. So this has been really useful to, to look at the importance of traits um, across from everything from the small scale right up to how are they responding at community levels on, on large spatial scales. So what about invertebrates? So why, why is it important to have an invertebrate um, trait um, database? So invertebrates are the most, uh, one of the most um, species taxa on the planet. So this is um, a bioscape and it depicts the proportion of species in, on each species in each taxa um, on earth. And I just have to call out to, I've now got a, a lot of microbial friends um, who would um, completely um, pull me apart on this and say, yes, but what about the microbes and the, and the protists? So those would certainly give the invertebrates um, a run for their, for their money as well. But one of, one of the most species taxa. So if we look at this, um, there's around 80% um, of all species on the planet um, are invertebrates. So as well as the insects, which make up about 50%, we've also got things like um, the worms, the crustacea, the jellyfish, um, the mites, uh, arachnids and spiders. And if you look here, you've got things like the mammals um, or the reptiles making up a very small proportion of that. So as well as making up, as well as being high, highly diverse and making up a large proportion of species on the planet, of course, they're also super important um, for ecosystem functioning and providing us with a lot of um, ecosystem services that we rely on as, as humans. So for example, pollination, um, pest control, um, decomposition, nutrient um, recycling. And yet invertebrates are still rarely considered in conservation um, planning. And one of the reasons um, is that we still haven't classified um, or probably even discovered so much of the invertebrate diversity that's out there. And so it's quite difficult sometimes to even calculate, particularly in the tropics, um, species richness for so many um, invertebrate groups. <clears throat> 
So one way that traits might help is that they might um, help with linking um, these two um, functioning traits and functioning. And this could help us then predict how different species and different groups may respond to environmental change um, and then the knock on effects on um, ecosystem functioning. So invertebrate trait research has grown um, quite exponentially actually in the um, last few years. So you can see here from when it started in the early 2000s, um, this is only into 2016, I'm sure it's um, still growing. Um, and trait research um, itself has also um, um, increased in terms of themes of research um, studied in the sciences. So it's up there along with climate change, genetics, um, anthropogenic um, studies. So of course the trait-based approach is a simplification of the species-based approach, but its strength as we've seen with the plants is to be able to um, generalize and to offer um, clear um, mechanisms. And this is really important when you have these um, hyper-diverse taxa um, and lots of species that have not been described yet. So um, in the last couple of years, there's been quite a few um, reviews that have come out um, on traits of terrestrial arthropods. Um, so for example, Mark Wong has written an excellent review um, with a conceptual um, frame map and a kind of roadmap for trait-based studies of terrestrial arthropods. And this is really useful if you're thinking about doing um, any studies um, on, on traits in general, actually, um, animal traits in general. So here he goes through and he asks a set of um, questions. So how should we define the traits? Um, uh, how are these linked to different ecosystem functions? What sampling methods um, would we use for this? And what are the biases in those sampling methods? And that's quite important because in plants, you go out to the field and you measure um, the traits of those plants. But with insects, often what we're doing is we're, we're capturing the insects and then we're measuring the traits on them. And the way that we capture them can influence um, the, traits, um, the traits that we then measure. So for example, is our trap just collecting um, the bigger individuals of that species? Or if we're using museum collections, which, is, which are often used as well, do those have inherent biases that people always um, collect the, um, the species with the biggest horns, for example? So you're not give, getting a whole range of those um, traits measurements. Um, so there's lots of challenges that have been thrown um, up um, within these papers. So Marco Moretti's got a brilliant um, paper on a handbook of protocols for standardized measurements of terrestrial invertebrates. But again, how do you standardize across invertebrates, even across um, insects, and what traits measures that you're actually um, going to take? But what these papers do do is make us think more about trait measurements, um, which traits, um, how they're linked to function and what um, the biases are. So that's meant that most databases to, to date, rather than existing as these global um, databases for all invertebrates, have existed for single taxa. So we've got really good um, databases um, like Helios knows the um, the ants um, database, of course, we've got databases for carabids and um, for other invertebrates, so things like corals. So think about making standardized measurements for, for invertebrates would be to include corals with ants, with carabids, with, uh, with bees. So this is quite a challenging um, thing to do. So one um, database um, that I'd like to mention that I think is quite interesting that's just started up is Ecotaxonomy. Um, and this is a database that started up with the idea of um, combining um, species identification um, and traits. Um, so to be able to curate um, all this information um, in one place, along with environmental data, along with literature and DNA barcoding. And interestingly, this also allows for morpho species to be in, entered into there. And again, this is something that's particularly important for invertebrates where so many of our species have yet to be described. And so if they don't have a, a description, a taxonomic label to them, then often those measurements um, don't make it into analyses or, or, or into the literature. But actually there's a lot of um, data that could be got just by looking at morpho species and including morpho species and the traits from morpho species as well. Okay, so that was my kind of overview of traits and invertebrates and why I think it's 
um, important and some of the challenges in, in collecting invertebrate um, traits. So now in the second part of my talk, I'd like to move on to talk a little bit about some of my group's work um, on traits and on dung beetles um, in general um, to study species responses um, to disturbance. And so I presented um, some of this work at the um, ESA conference um, last year in Tasmania. This was super exciting for me. This was the first time um, I've been to Tasmania and I joined the um, pre-conference um, tour with a bunch of um, plant ecologists, it turned out. So while they were busy looking at all the grasses and the plants, um, I was rummaging around, um, super excited to see my first wombat, but even more excited to um, see my first wombat poo and to find out it really is um, quite, quite square. Um, and then the bonus was that um, I searched around enough and I actually managed to find one of the native um, dung beetles um, in, the, in the wombat poo. So this was a, a super successful pre-conference um, trip for me. So I don't know, um, for those of you who are listening, how much you know about dung beetles. Um, they occur on every continent except Antarctica. And they feed primarily on um, mammal dung, um, although they will eat lots of different um, um, types of dung. And so in Singapore, for example, we have a species that's found on python, on, on snake dung. Um, there are carnivorous dung beetles. There are dung beetles that feed on fruit, on fungi, um, on dead animals. Um, so the name is, is a little bit deceptive, but the majority of them are actually feeding on mammal dung. But of course, in the case of Australia, um, the native dung beetles are primarily adapted to feed on marsupial dung because that those are the native mammals. And so when the colonizers brought across all their cattle um, and their sheep, the native dung beetles were not really adapted to the dung of these large herbivores. Um, and so this caused huge problems in Australia because the dung was left um, on the fields. And of course, then it became an ideal place um, for flies to breed. So this was why you got this invention of these um, cork um, hats to keep um, away the flies. And apparently in Australia, um, it, was, it was quite awful to be out, outside sometimes in the summer when, when all the flies um, were around. So you can thank dung beetles for really allowing you to, to sit outside and to walk outside these days without being too um, bothered um, by the flies. So if you think about it, um, there's about 20 million um, cattle in Australia. They produce about 12 pats a day, 2,000 flies approximately per pat. So you get 480,000 million new flies emerging every day in Australia. So that's a hell of a lot of flies. So in the 1960s through to the 1980s, um, the, the um, government of Australia imported about 50 species of um, dung beetles from temperate regions that were used to feeding on cattle dung and sheep dung. Um, and about 20 of these have now um, established and are really common dung beetles now throughout Australia. Um, and so what the dung beetles are doing is, of course, they're burying the dung. And as they bury the dung, that means that the flies can't live in that dung. They incorporate it into the soil so the, the flies can't lay the um, eggs and the, the larvae of the flies can't hatch. But importantly as well, dung beetles also carry these tiny little mites. We call them phoretic um, mites on their body. And they don't harm the dung beetles. They're basically using the beetle um, sort of like a bus to jump between the different um, dung pats as the dung beetle moves around. Um, and what these mites do is that they're the ones that actually feed on the eggs and the larvae of the flies and help to control um, the, um, the um, fly populations for you. So you have the dung beetles um, and um, the mites that are really um, to thank for um, cleaning up the flies in Australia. So dung beetles have lots of different ecosystem functions. So that makes them good to look at these kind of biodiversity or trait functioning relationships. Um, and so they're of huge economic importance as well as burying the dung. Um, they help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by burying it and tunneling, oxygenating it by tunneling through it, which means that less methane is reduced um, in tropical forests, but also in pasture lands. Um, the dung contains seeds, so they help with secondary seed dispersal and um, very important, of course, for bioturbation and nutrient um, recycling. So as well as being great ecosystem service providers, they're also a great model tax for exploring these trait-based ecology or trait-functioning relationships. 
Um, so all you need to collect dung beetles um, is some sort of container that you dig into the ground, some sort of roof on the top. So you can use a plate like I have here, um, but you can also use a, a big leaf or something to stop um, the rain getting in. And then you need yourself or a willing um, participant or a local cow to provide you um, with some dung. And you hang that dung over the trap and the beetles will come be attracted to that dung and, and drop into your um, trap. So very, very um, simple. Similarly for the functioning experiments, what you basically need again is a, just a very willing participant um, nearby to provide you um, with the type of dung that you're interested in, in, in looking at. And then you can put this out and you can look at how quickly um, the dung is removed, incorporated into the soil. You can measure um, the bioturbation beneath it. You can put seeds or beads into the dung and look at the seed dispersal and seed removal. So in terms of sampling costs, both in terms of the equipment that you need and the amount of time and effort it takes you, dung beetles have really very, very um, low um, sampling costs compared to things like mammals where you need camera trapping or small mammals where it's very time consuming because you need to be monitoring your um, traps all the time. What's also been shown for dung beetles is that they're up there with birds as very good um, indicator species. So both biological um, and environmental or ecological indicators. So they respond very, very um, quickly to the environment. So this makes them good um, environmental indicators, um, but they're also fairly good surrogate um, groups for other species. So for example, dung beetles are of course very closely linked to mammals. So some tell it, knowing something about your dung beetle community and how healthy that is, is going to help inform you about your mammal community. Um, similarly, because they're relatively easy to identify, relatively big, they've got a very good um, group of taxonomists who work on dung beetles. Um, they're very good surrogates for other groups that might not be so well studied or are much more difficult um, to study. So you can manipulate and identify a lot of these guys in the field without having to bring them back and dissect their genitalia or put them under a microscope. So in terms of looking at the functional um, traits of dung beetles, what's traditionally been um, done is to look at these broad guilds, what we might call again, these, these soft traits or behavioral traits. So how they bury their dung. So for example, you've got rolling um, dung beetles with the longer legs that you've probably seen on TV that take, cut out the dung ball, roll the dung away and bury it. Um, you've got the tunneling dung beetles with the shorter legs that tunnel um, underneath it. You've got dwellers that live in um, the dung pats. Um, and then you've got beetles of different sizes. So splitting them up into size, into their method of dung removal or burial, and then diurnal or nocturnal activity patterns. Um, so dung beetles are one of the few um, groups of animals that have been shown to use the Milky Way um, to navigate at night. So using um, this sort of classification, um, so for my PhD, I actually published one of the first papers that, that used these um, um, rough um, functional groups um, of, of functional traits to look at um, biodiversity ecosystem functioning relationships in a terrestrial animal group. Um, and so here along the bottom, you've got the number of um, functional groups rather than, for example, species richness. And then you've got the proportion of dung um, removed. And you can see that there's this um, increasing um, relationship, which is what was often found in microbial or plant communities as well. But there's a lot of variation around this, depending on um, the functional groups or the traits of those species as well. So the identity of, of species and the traits within the group is also very important. Um, so dung beetles are good for doing this because you can manipulate them in, in fairly easy ways. Um, and why this hadn't been done before with animal groups is it's often difficult to do that. So the traditional plant biodiversity functioning type experiments are looking at the traits, you plant up your fields. So for example, the Jenner experiment, you plant up your fields with different, um, different um, species and then you look at how those grow in different um, combinations and measure their biomass. Um, here, you can't manipulate individual species, but you can manipulate at this functional group level. So you can put up exclosures that exclude rollers. So here you can see a little roller in the bottom who's getting frustrated because he can't roll his ball out of the arena. Um, and you can have meshes of different sizes that exclude or include um, smaller or larger um, beetles. <clears throat> 
So this was then done on a much larger scale across um, Europe or the Western Paleo-Arctic with different exclusion types for different groups and also for earthworms um, and found very similar results that functionally richer dung beetle communities um, have greater um, ecosystem functioning. But we then wanted to go on to say, okay, well, we've looked and people are using these, these sort of soft functional group classifications, but do those functional group classifications actually link to morphological um, traits? And so identification of these functional guilds was being done by actually going out and seeing them in the field. But if we could link the morphological traits to these, then it would mean that we could measure something like, for example, eye size or hind leg length on specimens. And then we could automatically assign them to those groups without having seen that behavior um, in the field. Um, so I had a brilliant, and um, she went on to be my PhD student, but when she did this project, she was actually doing her undergraduate project. So um, Beth Rain who spent her whole of her undergraduate summer holiday um, taking hundreds of measurements on beetles. So she took 22,000 measurements across 1,600 um, um, individual um, beetle specimens. And she took a whole range of measurements to do with body size, um, to do with um, wing um, ratios for dispersal. Um, she measured the legs to look at um, whether whether this fitted with the nesting um, behavior and various measures um, of eye size um, to see how that predicted nocturnal and diurnal behavior. And she also did this a range of, across a range um, of habitat disturbance. So going from old growth forests through log forests to oil palm plantations. So this was on specimens from um, Saba in Borneo to see how those train, traits might change across a habitat gradient and if there would be inter or intraspecific differences. So what she um, found um, was, was really super interesting. So, I mean, it might be predicted, but nobody had really looked at this before, was that these morphological traits really could predict um, these functional um, groups. So here we have it um, separated along these, um, essentially these um, two axes, um, where the triangles are the tunneling um, species separated here. So this is the separation on measurements of um, different measurements of hind leg length, whoops, back, um, of hind leg length here. So we've got the rollers down here and the tunnelers up here. Um, and then this axis here, it's not quite as clear, but this is separating on diurnal nocturnal. So it's very clear for the tunnelers that you've got a separation between up here, you've got the diurnal beetles and down here, you've got the nocturnal beetles. For the, for the rollers, um, the, um, nocturnal rollers, we didn't have very many of them. So they're very much nested um, within the diurnal um, rollers, but you can still see that they, they sort of seem to cluster together. And what's interesting is that we had this one specimen that had been classed as a facultative tunneler. So in all the literature, it was classed as a tunneler, but it had slightly longer um, hind leg lengths. Um, and it had been observed that when it was in high density um, environments, that actually it would, um, when it was in high density environments, it actually would roll. Um, and so this one very clearly then falls out in between the um, rollers and the tunnelers as a, different, um, as a different grouping. So that's quite interesting that this really does seem to work. So what she also did was look at the um, intra and intraspecific differences across the environments. I won't go into this too much because these are complex graphs, but she measured the traits for um, a set of species. And here is the value in um, logged forest, this dotted line. And then um, these here are the regression coefficients and whether these traits increase or decrease in this species as you move to um, old growth um, forest. And so what we found was that there are intraspecific differences in these morphological traits um, across the habitat types. And this kind of phenotypic plasticity particularly um, was found for traits associated with dispersal um, and reproductive um, capacity. But how good um, really are these morphological traits at predicting um, species responses um, to environmental um, change? So here we have um, two species that occur in Borneo. And what you can see is that the, if you do spot the difference, they're actually sort of morphological and therefore functionally um, pretty much identical. So their effect traits are essentially the same. They look essentially the same. The only difference here is that this has a convex um, 
um, pronotal structure and this one, um, no, so concave um, pronotal structure and this has a convex pronotal structure. But otherwise, everything else about them is really the same and the females are even more the same. To tell them apart, you need to look at the hair on the underside. So effect traits essentially the same, but what we found is if we look at the response traits, it seems so that, the they, that they seem to be responding to the environment in um, very different um, ways. So this is what I like to think of as a really nice example of the insurance hypothesis or the portfolio effect where actually having a rare species is super important for when um, things change within the environment. So across the bottom here, we've got old growth forest, logged forest and oil palm plantation. Um, and then you've got the two different um, species of Cetaceus and the two different colored um, greens here. And what you can see is that in old growth forests, you pretty much just get one species, Cetaceus diacus. And in the oil palm plantation, um, you just, um, you've almost got complete switch and turnover and you just get this second species, the renal fulliana. So something is making them respond um, across the environment. And in logged forest, you get a, a combination of these um, two species. So it's often said that the largest species are the most functionally important, um, but they're also the most extinction prone. And I think this is a good example where this is really not the case. You've got to really look at the traits and not just the morphological traits, but also the response traits um, of individual species. So here, yes, they're functionally efficient, um, but they're both the same size. And one of them is, is extinction um, prone once you change the habitat, um, but the other one survives really, really um, well. And so this enables ecosystem functioning, in this case, dung removal to be maintained even in oil palm plantations, because you've still got a large big beetle um, that has replaced um, this one. So in the forests of of Borneo originally, where the forest was completely forested, this um, Cetaceus diacus would have been the, the dominant um, species in the environment. And Renal pulliana, although it's not on this figure, it is there, it's just super, super rare. So it occurs in disturbed habitats. So for example, tree falls or along rivers. Um, and what's happened is as the environment has changed, um, those disturbed habitats have become more and more common. So you have oil palm plantations, a very disturbed habitat, and this has provided the perfect conditions. And so now this renal pulliana species is super, super common within that habitat and the diacus is really um, rare. So where you might have thought that renal pulliana was redundant um, several decades ago, actually this species turns out to be super important when that habitat um, changes. And so we were thinking, what is it that might be um, driving these changes? Well, in old palm plantations, it's hotter, it's more open, it's more disturbed. So maybe it's um, what we need to do is to look at the thermal tolerance and we need to to look at the physiological traits um, of the beetles. So I've got a great PhD student, Joe Williamson at Queen Mary um, in London, who's been um, measuring the um, physiological the thermotolerance traits of all our beetle species across this gradient. Um, and what you can see is that there's um, big um, differences in these, but they seem to be um, clustered phylogenetically. So these are all the Omphophagus species. These are the rollers and um, the Paragymna pleurus. Um, up here, you've got the, the Coprini. Um, and here you've got the two um, Cetaceous species. Um, and what this shows is that the Renal pulliana, the one that survives in oil palm, yes, indeed, does seem to have higher CT maxes. So it can tolerate higher temperatures, maximum temperatures, compared to the one that occurs um, within the forest. So this um, indicates that perhaps this is something that is, is driving um, these species responses. And Joe's now looking at this in more detail and looking at um, the gene expression um, patterns in these species. So what we can do then with this is we can start to look at scaling this up across the environment. And what's been super important recently is that using LIDAR, we can now look at microclimate conditions at scales at which dung beetles and other invertebrates um, are really using and responding to the landscape. So we can look at LIDAR. Um, what's traditionally been done is to look at LIDAR at the sort of the bigger and the landscape. Um, um, LIDAR look at temperature um, at the bigger and landscape scales, but now we can get this right down to the plot scale or in, even what's affecting an individual at um, the point where it's living. And so you can match these um, temperature changes across the landscape um, with um, um, the abundance and the distribution of your individual beetle species. 
And we can do this not just for our Cetaceous, but we can do this for all the species in the landscape and look at what traits are predicting where species are found and how this relates to things like um, temperature. Um, and this allows us then to predict functioning um, based on traits um, and the distributions and different climate change or, or landscape um, um, change scenarios. So I think this is um, really um, exciting what we can do now combining all these data sets. So I had another student um, who was also at the same time looking at um, sexual selection and sexual selective traits. And what he found was also super interesting. So he found that there's a positive effect of sexual selection on species persistence um, across the landscape. And he did this across um, all the um, dung beetle species we were looking at. So he was measuring the testes and he was measuring um, the horns um, on the beetles. And the size of the horn, um, is an indication of the major males within that environment. And the more major males you have, the kind of healthier you assume that your population is. And so just looking at these two species again, what we can see is that the proportion of major males is highest in the habitats in which they prefer or they occur most commonly. So you have here the diacus and it's the forest species and it's got the highest number of major males in the environment, in the old growth forest types. Um, whereas here you've got the Renal Pulliana, which is the oil palm um, dominant species, and it's got its highest proportion of males um, within the oil palm types. So what we think is that it's both these thermal differences and sexual selection differences, sexually selected traits that are driving species coexistence in this landscape and allowing ecosystem functioning to be maintained in this landscape. So the importance of considering multiple different traits, even ones that you think um, might not immediately spring to mind is super important. So just quickly, I want to talk about a few um, models that um, we've been um, using to, um, to combine um, species trait information into larger data sets. So we can use these spatially explicit joint species distribution models. I'm not going to go into them, um, but these are latent variable models and they allow us to um, take into account abiotic and biotic um, factors when we're looking at the distributions across landscape but also in a kind of fourth corner approach to bring in dung beetle or, or species traits as well. So actually to combine species traits and see how much they explain in distributions across landscapes. Similarly, um, you can look at how traits might affect um, movement across landscapes. So here, um, there's a very similar model um, to these joint species distribution models called joint species movement models. And these are spatially structured um, diffusion models. And what they do is they allow inference of both species, but also community level movement parameters from multiple, if you have multi-species movement data. So I was working with Otto Oberskainen and the University of Helsinki. And what he was doing um, was taking the data that we had from a huge experiment on mark release recapture um, of moths across a landscape in the UK, an agricultural landscape with forest fragments um, and um, um, hedgerows and isolated trees and how those species moved across the landscape. But we'd also measured the traits for the species. So things like wingspan, habitat preference, adult feeding, larval host plants. And so we could combine those traits in the models. And so for even for those species that had very few um, data points, we could use um, the data from other species that were similar to those and that had similar traits to predict how those species might move across the landscape, even though we didn't have enough data points to really um, say that in practice. So this is using traits to see how um, species traits to, to see how, um, um, how they might respond to changes in habitat and climate and to draw data from similar um, species with those traits. So similarly to that, we've been um, using this to look at dung beetles in, um, in um, Borneo again, and to be able to map um, how they move across riparian, um, forested riparian corridors within oil palm plantation, and to look at the traits that predict how those um, move. So you've got some species which just move within the corridor, and then you've got other species which come right out into the oil palm plantation. And this is just to say that now using trait data can really be built into these models and we've actually been using it and incorporating it into policy 
um, documents and, and policy briefs that we've been um, giving to um, people um, in um, policymakers in Sabah. Okay, I think I'm, I'm uh, actually over time. I apologize about that. So just to conclude, um, traits um, are really super useful. We can now start to build these into much more complex models to predict um, how species um, might move and respond across environments, environments and what um, effects that might have for ecosystem um, functioning in the environment. But we really need to think about um, looking at what trait measurements we're taking and in what context um, we're using them. But using this trait-based approach, we've shown that functional-based metrics um, predict ecosystem functioning better than our species indices, that for our um, dung beetles in Borneo, thermal traits um, and sexual selection traits seem to be driving this um, species coexistence and distribution across the landscapes um, within Borneo. That we can use community level traits so we can draw on traits from um, other species um, with similar characteristics to help us predict movement and distributions um, across um, fragmented landscapes, even for species for which we have very um, little data. But we really need to think about the questions and think about the traits that we're measuring. So it's important to consider both effect traits and response traits when we're thinking about how species are responding to the environment and how they might affect ecosystem functioning. Um, so it's also important to consider multiple ecosystem functions. So in the landscapes that we're in now, um, that we're working with now, we're, we're not just thinking usually about one ecosystem function. So the traits that we're measuring, perhaps need to, we need to think about which traits um, are useful measures for which different um, ecosystem functions um, to make sure that we include species identity and context um, as well when we're making um, these predictions. So with that, I'd like to say um, thank you very much um, for um, listening. Um, I'm really happy to take any questions. Um, you can email me or um, look me up on Twitter as well. Thank you. Thanks, Eleanor. That was really great. Um, really interesting work and great to hear about it. And I'm glad that I've captured it on video this time because <laughs> I did want to have, have a copy of your talk after the... Uh, conference last year. I have got a question here um, from Melody and so I'll just um, get Melody to ask the question herself. Hello Eleanor, thanks Eloise. Um, fantastic presentation Eleanor, such interesting work. Um, thank you for that. Um, I have a quick question about the roles of intraspecific versus interspecific variation in trait patterns. And clearly you, you have been taking intraspecific variation into account. There was a big sort of fuss in the plant literature um, with Shipley some a decade or so ago about the real, the real importance of working with um, intraspecific trait variation and not only interspecific trait variation. What is your sort of perspective given the work you've done on the relative importance of taking intraspecific trait variation into account and I guess it depends on the question. Yeah I mean I would say it probably depends on on like you say on the question and and on the the taxa that you're looking at. I mean certainly for our dung beetles um, and there's also been some really good work by Hannah Griffiths on dung beetles where she also looked at intraspecific um, traits as well um, but for dung beetles it seems to be um, um, Quite, in, quite important. Um, so what we found in Borneo is that we're, we are getting these differences across the landscapes and the differences seem to be in the, in the response traits. So, I mean, this, how much this is, is driven by um, the change sort of genetics or plasticity in, in, the, in the trait um, happening across the, the landscape um, needs to be further investigated but what we do see is that there do seem to be differences for example um, in the wing shape which affects for example the dispersal ability between beetles that are occurring within oil palm landscapes versus the tropical forests um, so this might be then these individual species adapting and responding um, to these um, conditions so I think that most of the focus has always been on the intraspecific traits and of course which species are important and the identity of those species is super important um, and there are probably bigger differences there but I think ignoring the intraspecific traits um, um, is 
is something that, yeah, I think it's something that we need to look a lot more um, into and that can be, um, can be really important, particularly when we're looking at responses of, um, of the animals across the environment. Thanks, Eleanor. Fantastic. Um, I'll just make it so I can see everyone. So you can probably just put your hand up if you have a question. Um, I guess along, along similar lines, um, I was interested in whether, I mean, it's kind of a, really a very small sub-question of that, but for example, when you show those two species uh, that had quite different um, thermal tolerances, those two dung beetle species, and one was in the oil plantation and one was in the, um, the forest, did, when you measure them, do you take the ones, for example, from the, um, the logged, previously logged forest or the selectively logged forest uh, or have some way of making sure they're not sort of acclimated to those conditions and that it's not maybe something else that drives the difference but but that you can detect the difference in thermal tolerance because they become acclimated after they've already chosen it for some other reason. Yeah, I see. Um... I mean, so so Joe's been doing a, um, a lot of um, work on this, and so yeah, what we're doing is we're we're taking those um, from the forest and trying to test them immediately within those um, within those environments. So these should be beetles that are, are adapted to to that environment. So we've taken them from that environment, um, but it would be interesting to see as well, like how quickly um, they can, can acclimatize. So Joe's been doing some of these um, like heat shock experiments where you, you, you basically um, shock the beetles and then you see how quickly they're responding um, to, um, to that. And you can actually measure that. I don't know very much about this at all. This is something that's um, completely out of my field, but you can, you can look at that in sort of the genetic um, response and the pro heat shock protein response as well. So you can actually start to see um, whether they're um, able to respond to these sort of quick fluctuations um, or whether it's that they're adapted to that um, environment and, and, and can't sort of, um, yeah, can't, can't move out of that environment then. Does that answer your question or have I misunderstood it? Yeah, no, that, that does. Thank you. Um, do you have any more questions? I, I want to ask you also just something about um, uh, that eco-taxonomy site that you mentioned. So you're involved in that site? Is that, are you one so, of the people that set it up or...? Um, no, no, not at all. I'm um, so it's been set up um, by um, a group working at the University of um, Göttingen. Um, so that they set it up because they're working in the oil palm plantations in Sumatra, and they're collecting a lot of data in invertebrate groups, particularly soil invertebrate groups, and they therefore have a lot of morpho species, and they're interested in in looking at traits. So they set it up primarily for the um, project. Um, but they're now sort of expanding that out. So they're happy for other people to sort of use that database or help them um, expand it out. So I've actually been working with them. So we've been trying to put our dung beetle data into there as well. It's quite nice because you can actually build, it allows you to put in all the trait information as well or measurement information, taxonomic information. And so you can actually build keys and things within it as well. So it's kind of multi-use because you can use it to database um, and link environment data and literature and DNA barcodes and all these things together. Um, but you can also, it also allows you then to, to build keys and to use it for identification as well. Um, so I, I find it quite, quite useful for the things that we've um, been doing. Um, we, we did want for the dung beetles to build our actual sort of own database a little bit like the ant one, but we've not never been able to get money um, <laughs> for it. So in the meantime, we've been sort of playing around with these ones um, that already exist basically. But I think it's, it's, quite, a, it's quite an interesting um, site to have a look at. Yeah, yeah, it looks like a kind of flexible option of um, that gives you, you know, options of a few different things. And I think that increasingly, bar including barcoding in these, it's important yeah. um, and also I guess having this sort of geographic data as well so yeah. I might take a closer look at that one. <laughs>
Yeah, they're very um, open to people sort of um, working with them or putting their projects into the kind of framework, so. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? Can't see any, so. Um, <laughs> Overwhelmed by dung <Dunby. laughs> Yeah. Okay, um, well, if not, um, Eleanor, thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, it was really great to have you. Um, and um, yeah, best of luck with the traits work. It's really yeah, interesting. Thank you. You too. Um, yeah, I hope one day I can come and um, visit you. <laughs> that would be <laughs> excellent. <laughs> Hopefully not in the too distant future. Too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, Thanks, Eleanor. Thank you.